Earthquake struck northeastern Japan on Friday, generating massive tsunami along broad areas of the Pacific coast. The government has declared an emergency situation at one of Tokyo Electric Power Company's nuclear power plants in quick stricken Fukushima Prefecture. And tsunami warnings have been issued for many countries in the Pacific region. Now the news in detail. A massive earthquake and tsunami that struck northeastern Japan on Friday has killed at least 48 people. Many people are missing, while authorities are warning Pacific coastal areas to be on the alert for possible tsunami of up to 10 meters high. Japan's meteorological agency says the quake on Friday afternoon had an estimated magnitude of 8.8, .8, making it the most powerful one to hit the country since record-keeping began in the late 19th century. The quake struck at 2.46 p.m. local time of the Pacific coast of Miyagi Prefecture at an estimated depth of 24 kilometers. Tremors in Miyagi registered an intensity of 7, the maximum level on the Japanese scale of 0 to 7. Strong tremors were felt hundreds of kilometers away, including in Tokyo. Several magnitude 7 class aftershocks continued off the Pacific coast. The meteorological agency has issued major tsunami warnings to broad areas from Hokkaido in the north to Tokushima in the west. The agency says these areas could see water levels surge by more than 10 meters. At 3.50 p.m. Friday, a tsunami surging higher than 7.3 meters struck Soma port in Fukushima prefecture. A 4.2 meter tsunami hit Oarai in Ibaraki prefecture at 4.52 p.m., while tsunami more than 4 meters high struck Kamaishi and Miyako in Iwate prefecture at 3.21 p.m. NHK has learned that at least 48 people have been killed in the quake and tsunami, including 17 in Iwate Prefecture, 9 in Miyagi Prefecture. Many more are missing. A six-year-old child was killed in Miyagi when the ceiling of a supermarket collapsed. The child's mother is reportedly in serious condition. At least 97 fires have been reported in nine prefectures, the largest number of them in Miyagi. In Chiba Prefecture, a massive blaze is raging at a Cosmo oil refinery. A man in his 30s has reportedly suffered severe burns all over his body. Narita Airport near Tokyo has partially resumed operations, but several airports remain closed in northeastern Japan, including one in Sendai. Shinkansen bullet train operations have been called off for the day in central and northeastern Japan, and all train services have been suspended in the Tokyo metropolitan area. Expressways are closed to traffic in northeastern Japan and in central Tokyo. According to electric power companies, 4.4 million households in northeastern Japan are without power. Nearly 4 million more households are also under a blackout in the Tokyo metropolitan area. The meteorological agency is warning of more possible tsunami and aftershocks. It says people in areas where major tsunami warnings are in effect should evacuate to safer ground. Prime Minister Naoto Kan says the government will do all it can to rescue and support those affected by the massive earthquakes that struck northeastern Japan on Friday. He stressed that saving lives is the top priority. All cabinet ministers gathered for an emergency meeting on Friday afternoon. At the meeting, Khan called for calm as he warned those in coastal areas against tsunami and urged them to evacuate to higher ground. He also asked people to help each other and act to minimize possible damage. Khan said the government has asked the self-defense forces to mobilize and said fire authorities and police are gathering information. Khan said the government will make every effort to grasp the extent of damage and respond speedily to it. Early on Friday, the government framed the basic quake response policy. It includes taking all possible measures to evacuate residents and rescue and support those affected. Emergency teams will be dispatched across the country and the government will work closely with local authorities. 
The government also says it will duly provide accurate information so that affected residents, local governments and related organizations can make informed judgments and act. The government has declared an emergency situation at one of Tokyo Electric Power Company's nuclear power plants in quake-stricken Fukushima Prefecture. It says no radioactive materials have been leaked. Tokyo Electric said an equipment failure has made it impossible to cool two reactors at the Fukushima No. 1 plant. The firm says it does not have enough electric power to cool the reactors, which automatically stopped operating when the quake struck. The government has taken precautionary measures to ensure the safety of nearby residents, but it says that the residents should remain calm and that currently no evacuation is needed. The power company is sending eight power generators to the site, and the ground self-defense force is sending one more. Tsunami warnings have been issued for many countries in the Pacific region. China's state-run Xinhua News Agency says the country's Oceanic Forecast Agency has issued a warning for tsunamis up to 60 centimeters for coastal regions from Shanghai to Guangdong province. Russia's Emergency Management Ministry has issued an evacuation advisory for residents of the Kuril Islands off the coast of northern Japan, including four islands claimed by Japan for fear of a tsunami. Taiwan's weather agency has issued a tsunami warning for the northeastern coastal region. Indonesia's weather agency is calling on residents in the country's east to be on high alert for tsunami. The Philippines Volcano and Seismological Research Institute has issued a tsunami warning for the country's eastern coastal regions. U.S. meteorological authorities have also issued extensive tsunami warnings for Pacific coastal areas, including the U.S. West Coast and South America. You are listening to NHK World Radio Japan in Tokyo. NHK World's Yuko Fukushima spoke with Professor Yasuo Tanaka of Research Center for Urban Safety and Security at Kobe University about the latest earthquake. Um, first of all, how can you say how big this earthquake is? Well, oh, this is a really big uh, earthquake. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this is the uh, same uh, size of the earthquake we had it in that uh, uh, Chile earthquake uh, in uh, uh, last year, in 2010, in February, we had uh, this uh, uh, same magnitude of the 8 point, uh, nearly 9 uh, magnitude. So, uh, like, uh, uh, we had a uh, uh, Hanshin, Great Hanshin earthquake uh, in Hyogo Prefecture, uh, and uh, yeah. that is uh, only 7 point three so compared to that uh, it's a really huge it's aspect 8 .8 that, now so how do you think the damage mm. will be how big do you think the damage will be I'm well sure it's still uh, mm. hard to estimate but I haven't uh, you know the got the uh, exact figure but uh, uh, for this uh, you know earthquake uh, it's uh, Japanese government has been sort of predicting our uh, starting uh, before and uh, there has have been, have been some sort of prediction that uh, you know the casualties and that uh, you know the uh, how many uh, buildings being collapsed and so, on. so next uh, really the task is uh, how how this uh, you know the uh, prediction is accurate uh, based on this. But uh, in the last uh, you know the uh, uh, before the you know ask, uh, Second World War uh, there was a uh, earthquake in the something like uh, eight point two in the same area and that uh, it's called uh, killed three thousand people. But, uh, 3, uh, yes, three thousand people. But uh, now that it's uh, you know the population is increasing and uh, having a much much higher uh, intensity, maybe we have a uh, more you know the. Uh, so hard more than 3,000, right. Mm. And um, as you just said, the government um, have been predicting this earthquake yeah. off um, Sendai and off the yeah. northeastern part mm -hmm. of Japan coast. Can you detail on that a little bit? Uh, yes, I think uh, you know the Japan being uh, putting a quite a uh, intense uh, study on this uh, how when uh, this uh, you know the earthquake uh, uh, occurs, and uh, this uh, in the this area the uh, earthquake of this size or uh, slightly bit, uh, smaller size being happening uh, every hundred years. So they are uh, expecting uh, such an you know, earthquake uh, happens any time. But uh, I think uh, really it's all the uh, the 
uh, uh, damage depends on the when the that's you know the earthquake occurs. So this time is uh, quite uh, you know the, in the daytime, many people is working, and uh, so uh, the, the the really it's it's uh, uh, you know the damage could be higher. Mm -hmm. So the government and experts have been preparing for yes. this kind of big mm -hmm. um, earthquake. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what kind of um, uh, preparations were no. carried no. out? First, uh, you know, the really recent, uh, you know, the development is uh, in Japan. We have uh, this uh, uh, earthquake early warning system, and that uh, worked very well this time. Uh, actually, I was in in that in Tokyo, and in the, one of the conference, and uh, there was uh, this early uh, earthquake warning came, and uh, they warned about uh, 35 seconds. The the intensity uh, three is hitting, and uh, really it's uh, uh, something like uh, 30, 40 seconds uh, in advance notice. So so that kind of the really is, uh, you know, the prediction precisely, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, predicted that, that uh, uh, arrival time of the earthquake. But the magnitude was, uh, you know, the much bigger, uh, the, there was a five. So such, you know, the strong shaking they predicted. But uh, really another difficulty is that it's, uh, you know, the extent of that and the height of the tsunami, right. which is uh, really something we need to know, you know, the, whether that the prediction was, uh, you know, exactly the same or not. That, that's uh, crucial. So the height of the tsunami might not have been predicted. Well, that's uh, something I, I have to figure out, and uh, it's, uh, there is a many, many reports, and uh, um, the largest, uh, you know, the tsunami height is a uh, 10 meters, something like that. So I, I, whether that's, you know, the 10 meters, you know, tsunami being expected in the exact place or not, that is a uh, problem, I mean, the point. Right, so going on from now, mm. you just said that there were, like, um, a big earthquake, one in 100 years. Yes. Do you think this was the earthquake? Yeah, probably uh, this uh, you know, the, this size of the, uh, the you know uh, magnitude. It really depends on the uh, size of the uh, fault rupture, and uh, I think uh, this is uh, I have to really you know examine. But uh, probably this is the size of that you know the earthquake they've been uh, expecting. Yes. Uh, do you think there will be more earthquakes from now on? Well, I think uh, that having uh, such a you know, large uh, intensity of earthquake uh, probably it will you know that it's uh, release uh, quite a lot of energy. So I really do hope that. Uh, you know that in the uh, times come uh, we we are getting a much less uh, earthquake but i think uh, really uh, any uh, earthquake can create uh, you know the uh, tsunami and uh, uh, all the this you know the damage has been done like you know the protection of that uh, uh, coast being already you know the damage so there is no means to protect so even the small tsunami can uh, give additional large damage so we have to watch out that was Professor Yasuo Tanaka of Research Center for Urban Safety and Security at Kobe University speaking about the latest earthquake. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yukio Edana has called on people in the Tokyo metropolitan area who are away from home to wait in safe places such as their offices. Edano said at a news conference on Friday that the massive earthquakes have halted rail and other transport in the area and it is not known when they will be restored. He warned that overcrowding on sidewalks could make it dangerous to try to walk home. He added that some people walking may fail to receive the latest quake information and have difficulty accessing food, water and bathroom facilities. <laughs> And here's the repeat of the top story at this hour. A massive earthquake and tsunami that struck northeastern Japan on Friday has killed at least 48 people. Many people are missing, while authorities are warning Pacific coastal areas to be on the alert for possible tsunami of up to 10 meters high. Japan's meteorological agency says the quake on Friday afternoon had an estimated magnitude of 8.8, .8, making it the most powerful one to hit the country since record-keeping began in the late 19th century. The quake struck at 2.46 p.m. local time off the Pacific coast of Miyagi Prefecture at an estimated depth of 24 kilometers. Tremors in Miyagi registered an intensity of 7, the maximum level on the Japanese scale of 0 to 7. Strong tremors were felt hundreds of kilometers away, including in Tokyo. And that was the news from NHK World Radio Japan in Tokyo. I'm Yuka Matsumoto.
welcome to Radio Japan Focus. From our studios at NHK in Tokyo, I'm Risa Shimizu. And I'm Mick Corley. Okay, Mick, quiz of the week. What's black and white and has been missing from Tokyo's Ueno Zoo for about three years? How could I not figure this one out? The giant panda, of course. But why now, Risa? Tokyo welcomed the two pandas from China late last month. Because today is so-called Panda Day. On March 11, 1869, it's said that while in China, French missionary Armand David was given panda skin from a local hunter, and that David was the first person to introduce the giant panda to the West. Over a century later, in 1972, millions of Japanese flocked to Ueno Zoo to get a glimpse of Danla and Kanka, the country's first ever pandas. Since then, we've almost always associated pandas with Ueno Zoo until the death of Lini in April 2008. And I love the Japanese names for these pandas. Now we can look forward to seeing the five-year-old Bili and Shinnu, who have been named in Japanese Riri and Shinshin in public later this month. Hopefully by then they will have become more comfortable in their new home and will draw in the crowds, just like their predecessors did in 1972. Well, I'm sure they will. The names Didi for the male and Shishin for the female were chosen from a number of submissions from Tokyoites and were announced on the night. The couple will make their debut on the 22nd, and if we're really lucky, it won't be too long before we can welcome their offspring. You're listening to Radio Japan Focus. Many schools are closing around Japan because of the nation's low birth rate. Fewer children mean fewer schools are needed. But some of the former school buildings aren't being allowed to sit idle. They're being put to work to cope with the nation's graying population and to try to combat the low birth rate. Today, we'll take a look at the fate of a number of former schools. was held on March 5th to mark the closure of Iruma Elementary School in Saitama Prefecture, north of Tokyo. The school had more than 1,200 students at its peak, but that figure has dropped by three quarters, prompting its closure. It will be merged with other schools in the area. Former teachers and students turned out for the ceremony to mark the close of the school's 137-year history. It was an emotional occasion. Some of the participants even shed tears. We spoke to one of the school's former students. Four generations of children in our family attended this school. It's really sad to see it go. It would be great if the facilities could be put to other use and remain in some form. Many publicly run elementary and junior high schools are closing their doors or merging with one another because of the nation's low birth rate and the nationwide mergers among municipalities. More than 3,500 schools have closed their doors in the past 10 years. The town of Nikapu in Hokkaido is a famous center for the breeding of racehorses. The town has a population of about 5,800 people. It had nine elementary schools, but in 2008, seven of them closed their doors and merged with the two remaining schools. One of the closed schools, the former Higashikawa our elementary school has been turned into a privately run home for the elderly, known as Oro Nosato, the Owl Village. Very little work was done to convert the building into a home for the elderly. It features a lot of timber in its walls, floors, and so on, creating a warm atmosphere. Everywhere throughout the building, there are reminders that it once housed a school. The common room with windows is furnished with old school desks and chairs, while the original wash basins, which were built low for children, are ideal for people in wheelchairs. The seven classrooms have been converted into 22 residential units. An elevator has also been installed. We spoke to one of the residents. It's nice. The facility is fully equipped and it's bright and airy. 
The town's aging population prompted the conversion of the old school into an elderly people's home. About a quarter of Nikapu's residents were over the age of 65 as of last October. This ratio is above the national average. A private company involved in nursing care bought the former elementary school and converted it into a private nursing home. It felt there were more advantages to using an existing building rather than building a new one. We spoke to Tatuji Jinnai, the director of the Owl Village facility. We were able to match our needs. The town of Nikapu very much needs facilities for the elderly, and we wanted to build a facility that would be of use to such people. We didn't have to outlay much capital initially, because, fortunately for us, the elementary school had been renovated in 1994. We were quite satisfied at being able to put the school to another use. All 22 units are full and there's a waiting list for people wanting to enter the home. Schools are closing their doors with each passing year across Japan. The government is also showing interest in finding other uses for these schools. In June 2008, the Ministry of Education came out with a set of incentives to encourage people to put former school facilities to other uses. Publicly run schools in Japan are built by local governments with the aid of central government subsidies. This means that if schools close their doors and are put to other uses, the local governments have to refund the government subsidy. But the incentives waive local authorities of this obligation subject to certain criteria. The local municipality merely has to inform the Ministry of Education of what it intends to do with the former school facilities. A number of local municipalities are now working with the private sector to make use of unused schools. We looked at one school that has been converted into a daycare center in the hope that it will encourage people to have more children and bring about an improvement in the nation's birth rate. The Imagawa Junior High School in Tokyo's Chiyoda Ward closed its doors in 2005. But last June, it reopened as a children's daycare center. The center is run by a private firm, which has obtained an inexpensive lease on the buildings from the Chiyoda Ward. The center currently cares for 27 children, up to the age of three. The center is on the ground floor of the old school building. There's plenty of room to separate the children according to age. And there's also a playground for the children to play outside. We spoke to a parent who has a child at this center. There are spacious grounds and it's a great way of using them in the crowded city. In Japan, many women now work outside the home. In a growing number of households, both the husband and wife work. But the lack of child care facilities is a major social problem. There's a long waiting list for the cheaper nationally or locally approved daycare centers. The Tokyo metropolitan area has a growing number of children on waiting lists. The child care center established at the former junior high school is privately run, but because it operates in a publicly owned facility, it charges almost the same fees and provides similar services to a publicly accredited daycare center. We spoke to the parent of another child attending this center. I didn't know what to do when my child was put on a waiting list, but eventually I managed to get a place at this facility. I'm very grateful. It's easier for me to work now. Nationwide, there were more than 48,000 children waiting for a place at a child care center as of October last year. Many women in the workforce give up the idea of having a second or third child because of the lack of affordable daycare. This lack of assistance is cited as one factor behind Japan's low birth rate. We spoke to Tomohiko Takeba, a child support official in the Chiyoda Ward Authority. If the government can, to a certain extent, make the job of child rearing a little easier, it will encourage people to have a second or a third child. The ward stands to benefit by creating an environment more conducive to parenting.
<laughs> Professor Makoto Tsunoda at Tokyo Metropolitan University specializes in urban building. We asked him about the conversion of unused school buildings into old people's homes and children's daycare centers. I think those efforts should be applauded. Schools are usually quite spacious, which means they can be readily put to other uses. Schools could perhaps fill another role. As the population of school-age children declines, they could help fill the gap for the growing number of elderly people. Construction means building something that didn't exist before. What we need to do from now on is to shift our focus from constructing new buildings to making use of existing ones. You've been listening to Radio Japan Focus. This edition looked at unused school buildings being converted into elderly people's homes and children's daycare centers. Now we have some music for you. This is Okinawa Jazz Kyokai with Yui Reiru de Iko. Take the Yui Rail. That's it for today's Radio Japan Focus. Thank you for staying with us, and please join us again. From our studios at NHK, I'm Risa Shimizu. And I'm Mick Corliss.